One of the problems that's plagued the Guitar Hero 3 community for a while is that there's a limit to the amount of songs you can have on any given setlist. If you're an avid player of customs, you've probably run into this bug in the past. If you go over the lower end of the limit, the game will crash when selecting a song. If you go over the upper end of the limit, the game will crash when switching to the setlist. Even stranger though is that over time, the maximum amount of songs a setlist can hold seems to shrink. Eventually the game will just crash when a song in that setlist is selected, even if it worked fine just moments ago. The only fix the community has has been to remove songs from the setlist. The primary tool I'm going to be using is Hexray's Interactive Disassembler, or IDA. I don't have the source code for Guitar Hero 3, so I have to use IDA to figure out what the game's code is actually doing. I've already done a lot of work on Guitar Hero 3, which will make my job easier, since I'm not starting from scratch. So let's start. While the game is loading, I attach a debugger using IDA. Now when the game crashes, I can take control of it and see what's going on. So it looks like we're looking at a null pointer dereference. Basically, the game is trying to fetch an object that doesn't exist. We can confirm this by looking at the method where it did crash, and we can see that the register that's supposed to be pointing at the object is zero. So what does that tell us? Not much, because I still have no idea what type of object is missing. I'm going to have to dig deeper, so I'm going to peel back the call stack until I see something that I recognize. So the crashing function is being called by a method of the text element class. Looking further down the stack, I can see the game is trying to create a screen element through the create element factory function, which was called by the create screen element function. So the game is trying and failing to create a text element, which is why the game is crashing. So a screen element is more or less anything that can get drawn on the screen in Guitar Hero. The gems that you see on the highway, for example, are sprite elements, while the song names in the song selection menu are text elements. At this point, if I really wanted to, I could continue to relentlessly pursue the crash. However, I don't have the text element class mapped out and I would like to understand it before digging further. So my next quest is to find the text elements constructor, which should let me figure out the composition of the class. So a constructor is responsible for turning a chunk of memory into a functioning class. Whenever a new object is needed, its constructor will be called to set up that object. The biggest lead I have is that I know where the virtual function table is for the text element class. Since the text element has a virtual function table, that means it must be set when the object is being constructed. Now there should usually be at least two references to a class's V table. There will be one in its constructor and one in its destructor, or helper method for the destructor. I only see one reference to the V table though, which is concerning. So this method that I see referenced is actually a helper for the destructor, but I did not realize that until later. That means Ida for some reason interpreted the code for the actual constructor as data. Now I need to find that code. So to find the hidden reference to the V table, I'm going to do a binary search for it, as opposed to asking Ida what the references are. I get two hits. The first one is the destructor helper we looked at before. The second is a seemingly random slab of data. Now this random mess of numbers is actually code that Ida didn't recognize as such. You might be wondering why it can't just tell that it's code. A CPU at its heart doesn't distinguish between code and data. It is perfectly capable of executing data or reading and writing code if it really wanted to. So in the slab of data, I begin the painful process of trying to manually find where the function begins. I'm able to do this because I'm pretty familiar with x86 assembly and I can usually tell when something is real code or garbage. You'll get to this point with practice. Eventually, I find what I'm pretty sure is the head of the function, and I discover that the text elements constructor has been obfuscated by Securom. In case you've never heard of Securom, it's a DRM technology designed to make crackers and reverse engineers want to kill themselves. It has applied two obfuscation techniques here. The first is a technique I call function stubbing. So let's pretend we're a function that wants to make a text element. 
So we grab our chunk of memory, and then we go to the text element constructor to ask it to make us a text element. Only, it's not there. Instead, we have a sign telling us to go somewhere else. So we follow the sign and find a Sekiram guard. The guard gives us a sheet of directions and points us towards a deadly labyrinth. The instructions we have are very long and complicated. If we were a human, it would take us over 20 minutes just watching the computer step through each one. Finally, we get out of the labyrinth and find our constructor. Also, Sekiron pointed the sign from earlier at the real text element constructor. That means no other text element constructor calls will lead to the labyrinth. Just the first one we took. Now you might be wondering, why? Why do all this? And the answer is to ruin my life. When Sekiram splits a function like this, Ida isn't able to get any meaningful information out of the stubbed function. It will get the function signature wrong, which will often wreak havoc on the analysis of any function that uses our stubbed function, unless I manually correct the signature. If you don't know what any of this means, don't worry. The takeaway is that it wastes a lot of my time. Anyways, I get around the obfuscation by stepping out of the hidden code to find the head. The head's already been renamed though, which means I found it a long time ago, so I feel rather foolish for not searching for it first. I'll take the time now to give it its proper name and create a preliminary structure for the text element class now that I know the size of it. The second obfuscation that's been applied is function call mutilation. It trips up disassemblers into thinking a function has ended prematurely. So here's a normal function call. This is what you should expect to see from any sane compiler. However, if you're a cruel human being, you can replace it with these two instructions. And if you're irredeemable, you can go a step further and replace it with three instructions. Also, since most processors have function return predictors, the last two crimes against humanity should cause pipeline stalls because they're abusing the x86 instruction set. To get around this, I wrote a script to patch these calls into their more sane counterparts, so let's run that now. While I'm at it, let's patch out the jump to the Sekiron maze too. And now, we can finally look at the text elements constructor. Looking at the constructor, I can immediately spot a few things that I can clean up. For example, there's a few 32-bit data members that I'd need to split up into 8-bit data members. That's not enough info though. I'm going to need to find out more by debugging the game and watching what values get set. Basically, I find an instance of the class I'm looking for, text element in this case, and I redefine the data members of the class with more specific names and types in order to reconstruct the original class as closely as possible. One important thing I discover is that the missing data member that was crashing the game was supposed to be an Xbox text class. Also, yes, this is the PC release of Guitar Hero 3. The class is actually called Xbox Text. So that's the basic process I follow for reverse engineering a class. What I can't find through code, I find through debugging and vice versa. You get the idea, so we're going to skip the rest of this. So now I've mapped out the text element class, and I'm trying to figure out how the Xbox Text data member gets set. That's when I discover the bug. This actually took me a little while to find because Sekiram stubbed this function. So when a text element needs a text object, it grabs one from a concept known as a pool. When Guitar Hero 3 starts up for the first time, it creates a bunch of text objects and fills up a pool with them. That way, when a class needs a text object, it doesn't have to worry about creating or destroying it. However, Guitar Hero 3 doesn't have a contingency for when the pool runs out of available text objects. I'll illustrate how this crashes the game. For simplicity's sake, let's say there's 110 text objects left in the pool. Our setlist has 100 songs on it, so we need 100 text objects for the song names. Now we have 10 text objects left. So far so good. But what if we have scores on songs? We actually need another text object for each song we've gotten a score on in order to display the score next to the song. And with every song passed, another text object is used. Until finally, there are no text objects left, and the game crashes. So the proper fix for this would be to create a new text object every time the pool ran out. I'm lazy though, so I'm not going to do this if I can avoid it. 
I'm going to find out where the pool's text objects are allocated and bump up the limit there. My search doesn't last long and I find the function, which I then name initialize text pool. This is in turn called from the start engine function, where it passes the engine parameter pool text instances to it. The engine parameters are retrieved from another function, which just pulls them from a global. The engine parameters global is then set in another function, which actually just pulls the data from the game's QB storage system in some obtuse manner. The key it's filed under is pool text instances. So now I just need to go and find that in the game's main data file, qb.pack.zen. However, it's not there. At this point, I'm pulling my hair out a little, so I do a search for qb.pack to see if there's anything that gets loaded before it. There is. As far as I know, there's no tool release for editing raw qb files. Only one stored inside pack files, so I bust out my hex editor. The parameter is stored in the pool text instances key, so I do a search for that. There's actually two entries for it, and both are set to 375. I bump that up to a bigger number. And now I can play the game unfettered with as many songs as I want in a set list. Well, at least almost as many as I wanted. It seems like there's a new crash now, somewhere around 260 songs. But that's another adventure for another day. I hope you guys found this video informative. Until next time.